Okay, uh, we're going to get started as people trickle in. Um, thank you all for joining us for this session on disability in space. I'm Erica Neswold. Um, I'm an astronomer and the co founder of a nonprofit called the Just Space Alliance, which advocates for a more ethical and inclusive future in space. So there were some great talks yesterday in, in one of the sessions about the importance of including ethics in our conversations about space. And I think it was Mark Kelso in particular who mentioned the value of um, diversity and inclusion in the space field, um, which I was happy to hear because um, that's related to what we'll be talking about today. So for the next hour, we're gonna have a conversation about one particular barrier to inclusivity and diversity in space and related fields. And that's the barriers that are faced by disabled people who want to work in this field. Um, we'll be taking questions, uh, we'll be answering questions at the end of the session. So um, please feel free to type them into uh, the Hoover app or the Zoom Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. So to start off with, um, I just want to have my panelists introduce themselves to you. Um, I'm just going to go in the order that you're appearing on my screen. So uh, Lauren Lee Hallett, a couple of quick sentences to uh, tell us about yourself. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Lauren Lee Hallett. Um, I do different things in life. I did a lot of space law and policy, and I still love to write about this. Right now, I'm more focused on cybersecurity since I recently became a consultant. And I also uh, try to do uh, advocacy on neurodiversity, especially in the workplace. Thank you, Lauren. Um, AJ Link, you're next on my screen. Hey y'all, I'm AJ. I have on a gray shirt with white text that says support the troops and it has some stormtroopers underneath. Uh, I have a pink hat on and a beard. Uh, I am based in uh, Anacostian and um, Piscataway in lands. And I do disability in space as part of the Astro Access team. We just had a press release uh, this week, which is pretty amazing. We're having our second zero G flight. Uh, I am also the director of the Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity in Aerospace Task Force at the University of Mississippi Center for Air and Space Law, and I am a professor of space law at Howard University Law School, among other things, and I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, AJ. Uh, Jared Mesh? Hi, folks. My name is Jara Mesh. Um, I am a white person with brown hair and green glasses. Um, I'm wearing a green sweater. And um, I am a designer, artist, and scholar. Um, my work incorporates um, embodied knowledge as design practice with a focus on queer disability and access in the Anthropocene. Um, I am a member of the Critical Design Lab based at Vanderbilt um, and a board member with the Just Space Alliance and a lecturer in Design and Innovation in Society and Science and Technology Studies at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Thanks, Jared. And last but not least, Damien Williams. Damien, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, um, my name is Damian Williams. Um, I'm a black man with uh, glasses. Uh, my hair is shaved on the sides and uh, naturally long in the middle. Uh, my, uh, I'm wearing a black shirt buttoned up with a purple paisley tie. Um, my uh, work is in the ways that marginalization affects technology. Um, in particular, I think about the ways that marginalized identities are and aren't represented within artificial intelligence and algorithmic systems. Um, but I also talk about the ways that uh, space access and uh, human biotechnologies intersect with the concepts of marginalized lived experience. Um, I'm also a board member of the Just Space Alliance. And I am currently also an assistant professor of philosophy and data science at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Thank you, Damien, and uh, thank you, everyone. So um, to start off with, usually when I have these conversations about disability and space, especially space travel, um, many people that I talk to tend to think of disability as just meaning the inability to pass one of those really rigorous NASA uh, physical and health screenings that astronauts have to go to. But today we're going to be talking about disability on a broader scale. So I'm wondering if um, one or more of you could talk about 
your definition of disability in the context of this conversation in particular. And I want to start with uh, AJ first, because I know you, you gave me a great definition early. Hey, y'all, this is AJ. I think oftentimes when folks think of dis disability and, and being disabled, they have an extremely narrow view. Um, but disability can be an identity that people self-identify with, so capital D. And it's the experience of going through a world and a world that has tons of barriers, right? Experiencing ableism, um, whether or not you're diagnosed with a specific medical condition um, or even impairment, you know, based on the language that's in the law, um, you can be disabled, right? You can, you can be disabled by spaces that don't allow you access. Um, you, can, you can be disabled based on your daily experience. I think um, part of disability inclusion in space is having a broader industry understanding of what being disabled means. And it's not always self-identification, right? You know, some people may have a disability and may not view themselves as capital D disabled. And I think it's really important that we have these nuanced conversations about how people identify themselves and how people uh, want to, to, I guess, experience and, and move through the world. And I think more disabled people in the aerospace industry would be helpful. Um, but even if there aren't more disabled folks, we still need to be having these conversations so that we can work on including them. Thanks, AJ. Um, does anyone else want to comment on this? Um, uh, your definition of disability in, in the context of space? Uh, Lauren. Um, I'm jumping a little bit on what AJ just said. Yeah, this is Lauren speaking, by the way. Um, I feel like we're seeing now recently, um, for example, initiatives by ESA to have the para astronaut um, program. And I know that the UN also organizes some event about space for disability or something like that. But as was said, it's, it, it keeps a very constrained idea of what disability is. And I feel like we can think, okay, it's nice because we have measure, uh, initiatives that talk about disability and include dis disabled people or people with disabilities. But in the same times, because it's always focused on the same um, disabilities or the same constraint idea of disability, it reinforces cliches that people may have and that, you know, when they see or hear about disability, they see a wheelchair. And so I feel like it's, we, especially in, in space flight or in the space sector in general, we really need to understand that, um, basically as AJ said, that uh, disability is not just like one thing, but it's like there are so many people that have disability as part of their identity and that see differently and experience differently. So it's important to yeah, widen our um, understanding of disability. That's a great point, Lauren. And um, for audience members who aren't familiar with the, the reference to the ESA Parastronaut Program in particular, uh, that's a new program that the European Space Agency um, was welcoming applications for last year, uh, where they were inviting people who um, were qualified candidates for their astronaut program, but had certain disabilities that would disqualify them. Um, they were inviting them to the, apply for this program with the goal of, quote, defining the necessary adaptations of space hardware. But they had a very specific list of disabilities, as you mentioned, Lauren. Um, they were looking for people who had um, lower limb differences or leg length difference differences or a, uh, a height below 130 centimeters, which is four foot three. Um, and, and that was it. That was the entire list of disabilities. Um, but this leads into the next question I wanted to ask, which is that, um, so for most of the history of human spaceflight, astronauts have had to pass these really rigorous physical screenings um, just to be accepted as an astronaut candidate. Um, and that is very slowly starting to, to change, uh, especially with um, the increase of private space travelers. Um, for example, um, Haley Arsenault was uh, the chief medical officer on the Inspiration4 mission, which was the first also civilian space flight last year. And she has a prosthetic uh, bone in her leg she was the first person to fly into orbit with a prosthesis. Um, and so I wondered if any of you wanted to talk about any uh, of other examples of, uh, of this slow increase in accessibility to space. And um, AJ, in particular, if you're curious, uh, if you're interested, I'm curious uh, about uh, talking about mission after access, which you mentioned in your introduction. Hey y'all, this is AJ, I'll go first again. I don't want to monopolize the space, but I think um, 
again, it's kind of slow and incremental, which to Lauren's point, you can be like, yay, it's happening. But also ESA's program uses the term para-astronaut instead of just astronaut or, you know, an astronaut with a disability. It's, it's still othering in a way. And I think that um, having people go to space with different types of disabilities like Lauren was talking about is incredibly important. So at Astro Access, we've had one uh, parabolic flight uh, and we've had other partner flights and we're, we're having our second flight in Houston um, in a couple months. And what we're doing is we're looking to show what um, adjustments or accommodations or accessibility designs need to be made to include more folks. And that's not just folks in wheelchairs, right? But that's also blind folks. That's also deaf folks, right? One of the, the things that we have tested in zero G is how do people read sign language? Is it is is it possible to understand sign language from different um, vantage points, right? Like uh, upside down or, or sideways or whatever, is it still legible? And I think, you know, the push is, is happening, but in so many ways it mirrors the disability rights and disability justice movements um, that happened prior to us getting into space, right? It's, it's very slow, it's very incremental. And it's, it's frankly just, not enough and and it's underwhelming and i know there are a ton of people in this space doing the work like we have a whole panel which is great but we still don't have openly disabled folks who are going into space long term and it not being something that is special or different you know um in the same way that now that we have women going to space and i know we're, we're really celebrating the first woman going to the moon but we have you know a history of lots of women going to the iss right you know we have the, the horrible history of of women getting like 100 tampons for a week or whatever uh, um, which is you know another sign of lack of cultural competency and knowledge, but still it needs to get to the point where we're regularly having disabled folks and folks with different kinds of disabilities and especially those disabilities that are non-apparent being able to go to space and experience space and being able to tell us how space affects non-traditional bodies and minds. Thanks, AJ. Um, you mentioned uh, Astro Access helping to for us to understand uh, how to better design uh, for accessibility in space, which I just think is a fascinating topic. Um, in fact, I, I often hear space private space companies talking about increasing the accessibility of space. And then when you get into the conversation, you realize that they mostly mean the affordability of rocket launches for other space companies. Um, but accessibility in the context of this conversation is about uh, people who want to travel into space, being able to live and work in space um, and to increase the accessibility of that through our technology and, and environmental design. So um, Jara in particular, um, actually, no, let me start with Lauren. Lauren, you had your hand up. Um, did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I wanted to comment on what AJ and his colleagues are doing at Astro Access. Because, um, you know, when we think about space tourism, we may think that it's going to open the accessibility. Um, but I feel like, I mean, for now, space tourists are wealthy people. And because of the way society is done, uh, there are some categories of people and of citizens who are systematically and systemically in poverty situations. And, you know, for example, in a lot of countries, there's a ginormous percentage of disabled people who are unemployed. So I feel like space tourism is nice because it gets more people in, but in the same time, I don't think it's gonna diversify the pool of people that can be used for research. And this is where what AJ is uh, doing uh, so crucial because unless we build ourselves our own space to get on the table, I don't think that uh, it's gonna be done for us. So uh, yeah, I think what like Astro Access is doing should really be celebrated and probably replicated elsewhere. Thank you, Lauren. Um... So, Jara, I was going to ask, uh, sort of related to that, um, since you have a lot of expertise in design, um, how how can we center actual accessibility instead of just tokenized accessibility, as Lauren was saying, um, in both our technological design for space and organizational structure and policies? Hi, this is Jara speaking. Yeah, thank you, Erica. This is a good question. Um, I think first we have to define accessibility, right? Um, and then once we do that, um, think through the lenses of disability and disability, like disability justice and design justice, and there's some overlap there. And then 
think about what design is for these purposes and how it interacts with the histories and the presence of our current um, space industrial complex, so to speak, like military and commercial histories and whatnot. So if we start with accessibility, um, I would say, um, you know, generally we think of accessibility as checklists or protocols that provide access to disabled people in a built environment, whether it's um, a building or a space like this. Um, so in other words, how might people with various but very specific disabilities access this particular space and outer space, ISS, what, you know, wherever we're talking about, right? Um, and this is, I think, sort of along the lines of what the para-astronaut program seems to be doing, as you mentioned earlier, right? Figure out what they need, make sure it's provided. Um, so checklists can be written, followed, crossed out when they're done. And like, I would say that's the bare minimum of accessibility and what should always be done, right? But what this does is it elides the messiness that's involved in like a constant constantly changing body, right? So my disability, for example, causes muscle strength fluctuations. So some days I can run a mile, other times I can't stand for more than a few minutes, right? So my access needs change day to day, sometimes hour to hour. So an accessibility checklist doesn't really work for me as an individual, but I'm not, it's not just about an individual, right? Because this also, this idea of a checklist gives the idea that providing access to particular bodies in particular spaces is actual accessibility, which doesn't take into account conflicting access needs between bodies, nor can it account for all access needs at all times. Um, you can only think about so many things when you're doing something, right? So um, you know, Mia Mingus says something um, talking about disability justice, um, that accessibility is not logistics. I think that's approximately the quote, I think. And I think that's really useful here, right? So if we think of accessibility as a verb or a process, um, everybody's process is different. Um, so it first requires grounding in the intersections of race and gender, sexuality, class, immigration status, religion, and other minoritized personalities. Um, and so we can look at disability justice and see that disability and access are political experiences, right? Um, they're communities, they're full of history, culture, um, that are bound up in these larger intersectional knowledges, experiences, and whatnot. And so um, when we think about that, it helps us to think about how these, these communities, disability communities build power, both political and social, cultural power, right? And then um, we, share, we share survival strategies um, to survive ableism um, in, a day -to -day, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. And in that interdependence is actually key, right? Like, it, so this is again against the checklist, right? Checklist is about individual specific needs and specific bodies and disability justice is coming from this idea of interdependence where we really rely on each other for our day-to-day -day living. Nobody does anything alone and purposeful independence actually enriches our lives. And I can talk about that a little bit more in relationship to outer space in a minute. Um, but this is where we actually get to design now, right? And so we start with the idea that everything's designed. Um, space exploration isn't any different, right? Except that it's maybe more particular than you know your iPhone, right? It's got more specificity, more intentionality. Um, and it's expensive, right? And difficult to accomplish. So it's designed for very specific needs and very specific bodies. Um, and so like the rest of design though, it's, it's understood as solving a problem. Um, but the problems that are solved um, with space exploration when it's focused on people who are able-bodied on earth, but particular backgrounds, certain types of knowledge and not others is very different than the political experiences and communities full of history, culture, and legacy um, that uh, the, the disability is coming from, we can see that um, if we center disability um, as a disability access um, in this way, if everything is designed first from those perspectives and knowledges, we're going to have a very different, uh, different way of understanding. Um, and I think I would say, like, what is it that we actually want to get out of space exploration, right? Um, and that helps us to define our access, right? And so um, what happens if we, you know, what ruptures might happen if we, um, if we step back, if we take a pause? and say like, what might work for the future? What is it we want? Um, maybe it's withdrawing from space um, entirely. Maybe it's going back to our roots. Um, Fred Sharman has a project uh, called the Non-Human Autonomous Space Agency, I think it's called. Um, and it takes, it takes us back to the first earthlings in space, which were dogs, monkeys, and rabbits, not humans, right? So, um, so in this project, um, it, imagines, it imagines the experiences that would be possible if we had, um, dogs, monkeys, and rabbits going back into space using things like Twitter, right? Um, so it's sort of a, you know, designing a different future, designing a different kind of space exploration and sort of rethinking this, you know, very able-bodied specific human experience in space. Um, and so um, 
you know, I run, a, I teach a class on this also um, where we design outer, like our outer space experiences and um, students have come up with generational shifts that include two families from every country on earth, um, a communication system that not can only communicate with each other, but also back to earth. Um, so the technologies, the built environment, but also if somebody, if somebody's in, you know, on this generational ship and somebody, uh, their loved one passes away on earth, um, and they're three weeks into a six month trip, do you tell them, right? What does that communication look like also? So it's all of those things together, which is all about access in this sort of um, how, how we design access into a system. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And just because you don't do something doesn't mean it shouldn't exist. And I'll just throw it back, I guess, to everybody here, right? Like what might, what might the design question be um, for you, right? Or what kind of, what would design questions look like from a disability culture? and just a perspective um, in terms of a different space future. That was kind of long, but I'll stop there. No, that was great, Jarrah. And in particular, I really take your point about uh, checklists because uh, in my experience, people who work on the engineering side, especially in human space flight, they love checklists, right? It's a big part of the safety culture in particular. And so um, being able to step back from the checklist mentality of accessibility is really important. Um, Damien, did you want to comment on anything? Yeah, hi, this is Damien speaking. Um, I wanted to kind of play off of a lot of the points that have been being made. Um, our, our conversation about the, the representation of disability, the, uh, the, the slow progress that's being made, um, as you were just saying, Erica, moving away from the checklist model, um, the, the design justice aspects of this that you were talking about, Jarrah, like all of this, um, you know, in specific, Jarrah, the things that you were saying about um, seeing accessibility as a process, um, I think reflects a lot of what you were also saying about, you know, how the changing state of bodies is very rarely taken into account for this. Um, this Disability is a process in many, you know, many ways, many framings, in many cases. The existence of our bodies and the state of our uh, capabilities and uh, accesses within the spaces that we exist will change as we age, as we move from one space to another, um, just randomly. In some cases, with no real knowledge as to how or why, things change, um, and. One of the things that I find very interesting about the current state of discussion about space access is that um, in the original framing of what space life was going to be like, the paper Cyborgs in Space by uh, Manfred E. Kleins and Nathan S. Klein, that's Kleins, C-L-Y-N-E-S, and Klein, K L I. N E. Um, their original paper was entirely about the fact that your body is going to change when you're in space. Your situatedness within space environments is going to shift. You're going to need different interventions in order to be able to be alive in vacuum or in high radiation environments or in weightless space for long periods of time. And their entire framing for this was about making that kind of processual, you know, process-based access more uh, available and readily uh, understood as a need from the ground up. Klein and Kleins were also the developers of, uh, you know, some of the first rounds of antidepressants, right? Like, so they're the people who are doing work to try to figure out how to deal with other forms of disability and to help people navigate the world that is not accessible to them by giving them other forms of access uh, and, and providing, you know, different ways of actually integrating the needs of these you know, people who are otherwise left out entirely from the framing of these situations. Um, and so the fact that that's where this starts in the 1960s versus where we currently are, where we're having this conversation today about the first pair of astronauts, where, you know, Sherry Wells Jensen makes the case for disabled astronauts back in 2018 and then just gets to go on a zero G flight last year, year before last year, I think. It's, we're looking at 60 years <laughs> of space 
thinking as a weird side thought about what it means to be disabled, even though the founding documents of this idea are about disability. And the fact that that's been elided, it's been uh, obfuscated in so many ways in the public imagination about what space means and who it's supposed to be for, right? This access space, this, this way of being disabled also includes a way of being invisibilized many times. Being disabled often means being rendered unseen by the rest of the world. Um, being pushed off to the side at best, or uh, as uh, Alex Hayard says, um, negated the willingness of society to negate existence is a fundamental marker of disability in many cases. How willing is your society to say your experience isn't real? You don't exist. You shouldn't. We shouldn't have to think about you. And that's woven throughout all of this conversation. This is um, eight. I, I'm so sorry, Erica. I just wanted to add, like, you can see that, and at least in the English language, how disabled is a verb, right? To disable something is to turn it off, to make it no longer useful. And I think, you know, the historical context is important because the Gallaudet 11 was incredibly, incredibly vital uh, to, to the Apollo missions and, you know, NASA's, you know, objective in general, and they've been erased for the most part, right? Uh, unless you dig deeply or you're doing a panel on disability in space and they're not recognized. And, and I think Damien and Jared both made really good points about, and I know we've talked about disability justice versus disability rights, and this isn't you know, a disability, um, I guess, culture seminar, but uh, the way that we move into space is really important in terms of cross-movement solidarity cross identity solidarity in terms of how we are incorporating accessibility as an all around feature of space right space accessibility is not just financial access but that is a part of it right it's not just regional access and government access for global south countries but it is part of it right that is all part of the access and i think you know, moving into kind of disability studies verbiage, right? Space is disabling. And if you're using a social model, relational model of disability rather than a medical model of disability, then everyone will eventually become disabled in space simply by being in a disabling environment that does not provide access, right? And I think for a lot of people who aren't steeped in disability literature, they don't understand that going to space because it is dangerous, because there's not a ton of access, because it is disabling, will cause more and more people to be disabled, whether or not they identify as capital D disabled. I just wanted to make sure you know that, that was clear. Uh, thank you for making that point in particular, uh, AJ, and uh, for members of our audience again who um, haven't didn't recognize the reference to the Gallaudet 11. Um, they were 11 deaf men who participated in a research program. I think it was a joint program between NASA and the U.S. Naval School of Aviation Medicine who were studying the effects of weightlessness on the body, but these um, participants, the deaf participants, had damage to their vestibular systems that made them immune to motion sickness. So they were studied directly and used as uh, control subjects for all these weightlessness experiments that made uh, the other participants extremely nauseous, didn't affect uh, these particular events. So they were extremely valuable uh, participants in those um, medical research studies. Um, Jared, did you wanna comment? Yes, <laughs> if my uh, screen would actually, un yes. So um, this is Jara. Um, I was, AJ said something that just made me think about, um, you know, other other technologies, uh, design technologies um, that um, are centered um, through disabled people. And this is a, so Robert Heinlein wrote a story called Waldo back in the 1940s. And um, it, Waldo is, uh, Waldo has myasthenia gravis, which is actually the disease I have. <laughs> um, and so, um, they well, in the book they create something called like that's a, a Waldo, which is a like a, a remote access hand essentially. And so that has become something that even NASA uses now, right? These remote manipulators that are developed. And so the idea is that with my gravis, you don't have a lot of strength, so you need something else to help you. And so that's why he was using he was in outer space and he was using these 
Waldo's to do these really big projects they couldn't do with his own strength. And so now NASA actually uses those. So it's coming from this sort of disability, like this disability, this disabled person or chronic illness person's um, experiences. And then it became something that's in, you know, that the character becomes this real life, um, this thing that's now in real life, right? And so I think about like, what, what else might we learn from um, disabled designers themselves um, creating and thinking through the things that might be useful um, in, you know, in a, in a low gravity environment. So just a sort of side thought. Thanks, Jar. Um, Lauren, did you want to say something? Yeah, super quickly, building on what was said, I just wanted to uh, tap sur le clou, like we say in French, so like put an emphasis on the fact that generally speaking, but especially in space, when we start to make accommodations for disabled people or people with a disability, it ends up benefiting everybody, especially because everybody can become disabled from one day to another, whether it's because, as AJ said, space is disabling or because something happens to them. But I think people need to understand that it's not just something that benefits us. It will be good for like citizens as a whole. Great point. Um... So um, I wanted to, to pick up on something Damien mentioned a few comments ago um, about, uh, we, we've mostly been talking about physical disability in the context of space travel, but there's also a lot of barriers to working in space for neurodivergent people as well. Um, and I think that a lot of these same conversations can be happening um, about neurodivergence and, the, and those kinds of non-physical disabilities as well, uh, both in terms of designing for accessibility and inclusion, and also the, the benefits um, of learning, you know, the benefits for all of us um, from learning how to be inclusive for those people. Um, Lauren, uh, you, I think, have made a great point when we were talking earlier about uh, the potential benefits of neurodivergence for space travel. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? I think uh, having divergent, uh, like, diverse group of people in general can only lead to innovation if you have just one very homogeneous group of people uh, in, a, in an area that is particularly innovative or that has to be innovative like spaces, you need diverse people. And I think that the neurodivergent people, uh, I mentioned that because I'm autistic, so that's I'm talking, I guess, from my point of view, but um, I feel like it's very important. And the problem is that usually, um, when we are included, we're included in a very specific type of role, which is usually like, oh, you're probably good at catching bugs. So we're gonna make a program for autistic people uh, in like an IT program. So I think there's like a series of cliches that happen in like general society that permeate through the space sector that really should be rethought. I think, I mean, I think disabled people in general can serve in any, way they want in the space sector. They don't have just to be uh, guinea pigs for research. They can do whatever. They can be a CEO. Uh, they can literally, we, I think space is so important, such an important sector, so innovative. We need everyone everywhere and we should really stop, you know. I feel like sometimes inclusion can be forced. And so it's like, okay, we need a quota of this kind of people in this department and we really need to, to be, when we say we're gonna be inclusive, be actually inclusive. And um, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question, but <laughs> that's the answer. That was a great answer, thank you. Um, AJ, did you wanna follow up? Yeah, this is AJ. I also wanna point out that there's still several intersecting identities, right? So Elon Musk is has said that he is, dis, is autistic, that he's on the spectrum. Right, but is that actual representation of what other autistic people experience in the workplace, um, especially if you don't have enough money to own and create your own companies, right? Uh, if you're if you're not white, if you're not rich, um, you know, autistic autistic women, non-binary, um, autistic folks, trans folks. I think to the question about what does it mean for space, something that is really important is that we have different types of um, not just neurodivergence, but personality types because we have to understand how space affects all of humanity. Maybe space is really beneficial for, for introverts and people who do not like a lot of people and a lot of commotion. You know, maybe space is really, really bad for extroverts if they're locked in a very tiny ship for three to six months at a time, right? 
maybe people who have mental health disabilities like anxiety or depression are affected differently in space long term than people who do not have those mental health disabilities. I think the inclusion of those folks, like Lauren said, is incredibly necessary to understand how the broad swath of humanity is going to exist long term in space, if that's what we choose to do. Um, to, to Jared's earlier point, you know, if we even decide that that's the right thing to do. Great point, thank you, AJ. Um, Damien, you have your hand up. And this is Damien. Um, the conversation here, like the, the question again about representation in a kind of thoroughgoing uh, full way rather than this kind of tokenistic uh, ideal of, uh, you know, if we get one of this person and one of that person, then everything will make perfect sense. And we'll have, you know, again, like you said, you know, we'll have all the boxes checked, right? Um, you know, what, what Lauren and AJ are talking about here, especially is this notion of actually having a broad swath of intersecting interoperable disabilities to be able to have not just a checkbox, but an actual conversation about access needs. As Jero was talking about earlier, you know, this the the kind of um, when access needs are at odds, right? You don't when your when your checkboxes don't necessarily uh, line up properly. Um, you know, you you can't just say, um, well, we have uh, yeah the the entire space is a quiet space, um, but also that makes it dark. So uh, we're going to put bright lights in it and then uh, you can have it quiet, but it has to be bright. And for some people, that's not going to that's not going to work if sensory stimulation is a problem for them, but only certain frameworks of sensory stimulation. Um, and so having the full representation of people in that space more equates to actually being able to have that conversation to being able to design not in some uh, one size fits all universal ideal, but in terms of uh, interoperable, perhaps more modular types of access, right? And that comes back down to the conversation that we've been having about who's in these rooms, right? Elon Musk owns SpaceX, but Elon Musk also has billions of dollars and very intentionally separates himself from the way that you and I live our day-to-day -day lives. So is his perspective on these questions going to be in any way representative to, to AJ's question? No, <laughs> that's my answer. I think the answer is very clearly not, right? Like I think he's, you know, but having the understanding of what uh, you know what it takes to be a successful quote unquote successful capitalist neurodivergent person um, does frame the situation that we're dealing with. It teaches us something, but it doesn't give everyone involved or everyone who wants to be involved the access, the representation that they actually need in order to be truly a part of this going forward. And that's the framing that I think that we that we're needing in all of this. Thank you, Damien. Uh, Lauren? Um, building on what AJ said about um, not just including disabled people or neurodivergent people, but also different type of personality, it made me think, you know, sometimes when you read about um, human space flights or, or, I don't know, life in a submarine or something, you can usually read that, you know, constrained spaces really have a bad effect on people's mental health. And um, if you're in the ISS, that having a delayed circadian rhythm can also affect your mental health and lead to violence. I mean, take a person with ADHD, they probably live their entire life in a delayed circadian rhythm. So they're probably already a bit used to that. I mean, as an introvert and uh, autistic person, I thrive in super small constrained spaces. I love that. It just makes me feel super comfortable. So I think um, if you include these people, the research will look entirely different. So I think, you know, like we have a conception of what human space flights or just like space is in general and what it does on people. Uh, but I, I think, you know, it's only a fraction of the reality. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so, so you've, some of you have touched on this a little bit. I, I've mostly been framing 
the question from the start of this conversation um, about disabled people traveling actually to space and the, the barriers um, and the designs involved with space travel. Um, but most of us who work in, in space in a space related field are never actually going to travel for space. So I'm curious um, what kinds of barriers have you all seen or experienced for disabled people who want to work in the space field here on the ground? Um, and how can we increase accessibility um, for those people and in our industries and, and not just for the astronauts? And I'll open this up to any of you. Uh, AJ. Hi, all. This is AJ. I think one of the very first things that we we need to recognize is that disabled people do work in space, whether or not they're open and self-identify is different, whether or not they're comfortable or feel that there's a stigma around being openly disabled is very different from them, you know, experiencing disability in the workplace. And I think it's really important. Uh, there, there's still a very prevalent disability phobia throughout society, but especially in space, right? Like uh, a fear of disability, of becoming disabled, of, you know, like quote unquote, catching disability if it's, as it's, if it's contagious. And I think having more disabled people who are open about their disability in the space sector goes to the point about universal design and, and, and creating more accessible space traveling vehicles and you know entities and potentially communities in space like having the perspective of disabled folks is incredibly important for pushing the entire space industry forward in a good way i think you know lauren talked about a diversity of perspectives but disabled perspectives are often unique and that they experience things that other folks maybe don't even notice right they like <laughs> before before we were two years into Zoom and they had auto captions, they didn't have captions, right? And most folks didn't notice that, but the folks who needed the captions did. Uh, and now we have that, you know, on all the Zoom calls, you know, the same thing like television, right? Um, universal design is so beneficial to so many people, but to, to, to Jar's point, it often comes from the experience of disabled folks demanding accessibility. Right. Unfortunately, that's just where a lot of universal design and, and inclusive and accessible design comes from is disabled folks mentioning and outing a barrier to access and asking that it be removed. And so I think that's incredibly important to have, not just for your engineers, right, disabled engineers, but for your disabled uh, artists, your, your concept design folks, right, your long term planning folks about how we're going to create a sustainable company that can employ disabled folks and do it in an equitable way where we're not pushing them out and marginalizing them, where they're, we're allowing them to, you know, achieve uh, career success and, and move up the career ladder if they choose, right? And I think, Erica, to your point, not everyone wants to go to space. Not every disabled person wants to go to space. Not every non-disabled or able person wants to go to space. And that's okay but we need to be as accessible as possible for those that do want to have that opportunity. Thanks, AJ. Um, I'll also just mention that there's um, a very well-known pattern in accessibility, accessible technology design, I think that I've seen before where young, enthusiastic, non-disabled people want to help, want to make accessible technology and immediately design something, a prototype of like a wheelchair that can walk upstairs when in fact, the people who use wheelchairs are not interested in that, they're interested in more accessible building design, for example. And I think that's another reason why it's important, not just to design for accessibility in space, but to make sure you're including disabled perspectives in this. Um, Damien. Yeah, that is the, um, the what uh, Natalie Kane calls uh, means well design. Liz Jackson calls it the disability dongle effect. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it does nothing. It it looks like it applies to a problem, and the intent is good, but it's not really doing anything because nobody actually asked the people that it's supposed to be for what the heck they actually need or want in the situation. Um, and that is, I th think, yeah, it's ex as you were saying, it's exactly reflective of the situation. You know, the question of who is in the room when these decisions are being made, who is, whose voices are actually being not just, uh, again, not just tokenistically put into place, but heeded 
when concerns are raised, who has actual decision-making capability, who has uh, oversight capability within these frameworks, within these systems, um, and who has the, you know, the responsibility for ensuring that that kind of access, that training level, that administrative level, that uh, oversight and, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess we'll call it oversight access level uh, authority is in place. Uh, because ultimately, if the people who are making the, the decisions about what the design teams look like, about what the, uh, the building and engineering teams look like, don't have an understanding that they need to be thinking about these questions from the first place, then what is going to happen is that they're going to put together teams that look exactly like they look now. And we're going to continue to have these exact same problems. So it can't just be a conversation about how do we train our engineers better. It has to be a conversation about how do we get the administrators who are making the decisions in the first place, the educators who are doing the educating of the engineers in the first place, to be thinking about these questions, to be conversant in these topics so that they can be thinking about who's in that room who's asking the right questions, who's posing different ways forward that will actually meet the needs of disabled people. Um, Lauren, did you want to comment? Um, yeah, to come back on the original question of how to increase accessibility in, as in space professions, um, if you think of a space job as a stage in your life, uh, probably it's not going to be the first stage. Uh, so there's going to be a series of stages. And as a disabled person, probably you're going to have to face the same um, obstacles every time. So if you want to, you know, improve the accessibility of a space job, you also have to improve all the stages that come before. Uh, if you think about a building and you open the door on the fifth floor, but all the or stairs before that are like broken, it's not gonna do anything. So I think it also has to be integrated into like a broader accessibility and like education um, perspective, I guess. Great point, Lauren, thank you. Um, so let me ask this question because we're at a conference uh, supported by the policy studies organization. So um, in terms of policy, let's say, everyone on this call agrees with everything we've just said, what can they do about it? How can we approach accessibility from a space policy perspective? Um, does anyone wanna comment on that? Um, AJ, I think I asked you this question earlier in particular and you had a great answer. Hi y'all, this is AJ. I, I, I wanna say that my answer was, cause I try to stay consistent that we shouldn't just be focusing on forcing disabled representation and disabled inclusion, right? We should be building more accessible spaces. The policy should be to be as accessible as possible for the folks who want to pursue those careers, those interests, or be in certain spaces. And then people can self-select about where they want to be. Unfortunately, most of society says that they self-select when they don't because there are so many barriers to access that people cannot get into institutions, power, decision-making rooms, et cetera. And so I think the policy and, and the policy quote unquote fix is to just create a more accessible society. Again, that includes financial access, that includes access to resources, whether they be monetary resources or non-monetary resources, right? And if we really understand what access is, going back to accessibility and access being a verb, right? Then we are really, really digging at dismantling so many different barriers, whether that is racial barriers, whether that is uh, systemic misogynistic barriers for non-masculine bodies and expressions of masculinity, right? I think access for disabled folks centers access for other marginalized and minoritized communities, 
right? Like again, cross movement, cross identity and cross disability solidarity says, if we're truly being accessible, it's not just for physical disability and folks who, um, to Lauren's earlier point, are viewed as you know wheel wheelchair users and like that is it, right? Access is, is like a really truly radical idea if you're actually doing it properly. And that goes beyond just the hiring and the practices of hiring that goes beyond where you're going to recruit. That starts like giving students access to education instead of separating them out into quote unquote special education, um, which is the term here in the US, right? I think if we really, really want to fundamentally be accessible, we have to radically reshape society. And that is the policy answer. And that's just, that's beyond policy, right? That is like society, at its foundation. Uh, and I hope that is the answer that I gave when we were asked this question before we jumped on the call because I try to be consistent, but that is the actual answer of how you do it. And uh, that's an excellent answer, AJ, thank you. And for those of you who cannot see the video feed, uh, Jara and Damien are just cheering silently behind their mutes right now. So uh, Jara, I'm gonna call on you next. Yes. Uh AJ, thank you. That was exactly uh, amazing. Um, that's exactly it. Um, and when you tell students this, so I teach students, um, you know, in a design in design studio courses, and we build a lot of things um, over a, over a four year program. When you tell students that we have to change society, they say, "But I'm not in a position to do that, right?" And they say, "Well, you know, the company I'm working for is going to tell me what to work on, right?" And so this gets back to just talking about who's in the room. So what I tell students is, okay, so what can we do in the interim? You, if you say you have no control over these bigger policy questions, what can you do? And one of the things we're going to, one of the things we do is we say we have to bring inter, like we have to bring groups of people, very diverse groups of people into the room, but not just to listen to them. We need them to tell us what to do. We need them to become the designers. Um, disabled people are designers, um, hackers, makers. Um, Things are so inaccessible that you figure out how to do something and you share it with a friend and then they share it with another friend and it becomes part of that disability culture. Disabled people are designers already. Bring them into the room. Let them tell you what they need. Let them tell you how to do it. You don't get the disability dongles that way, right? Um, and then um, education, um, you know, if you're in an educational system where there's where there's design practices happening, um, you know, as a faculty person, I have um, certain rules for my classroom. You may not do disability work pulling things out of medical journals. You must actually work um, with, not for, but with disabled students or disabled people or disabled communities. Um, it'd be better if you were part of that disabled community to begin with um, so that um, I don't shut people down, but I also don't let them just run off and make something because they think it's cool. They have to spend time understanding it. And I think that's the interim, right? Um, because then my students go off, they become designers, engineers, business people across you know across huge corporations and then they may not have a say right now but it's in the back of their head when they see something they say well that doesn't really make sense and maybe they feel comfortable speaking up maybe they get promoted a little bit as they move up the up the you know up the chain into larger positions it's still there with them maybe hopefully right and that that helps to start sort of uh create that policy change um internally in organizations and by breaking it down to something small like that and say, here's where you start. You start by talking to people. You start by bringing them in. And not the traditional sort of design ethnography that goes with design thinking, but real social science, humanities, research, um, real ethnographic work where you're spending you know, months with communities, not a, not a two hour like workshop or hackathon or whatever you know, they, they call them, um, you know, where they hand you, a, a, you know, um, I've been handed a cane before and said, to, oh, you, you should redesign this. How would I know how to redesign a cane, right? Unless I, unless I was somebody who was using it and you know, understood it and whatever, right? So there's all these questions of like how you how you sort of go into it like that, but it has to be real research, um, real work with communities, and um, and then having those people who come in to work with you be the ones that actually create the the work, and you as a designer are, um, and yeah, I see somebody said autoethnographic, yeah, and autoethnography is a way to do it as well, right? Um, but when you bring people in. You're the facilitator as a designer. You're not the person coming up with the idea. And I think that's key too, um, to think about it and think about yourself as facilitator rather than, um, than, a, than you're in service to the people who have the need. You're not the person creating the idea yourself. Um, yeah, 
So, um, but really, I mean, AJ's answer is right. That this is just the <laughs> this is just the interim um, when they say, "Oh, I can't do it." Yes, you can. This is how. Right. Great point, Chair. Thank you, um, Damien. I think you had your uh, virtual hand up next. Yeah, this is Damien. Um, the you know, following on to both AJ and Jared, you know, this is that that full across the board structural shift of everything that needs to happen. Um, you know. It, the bits and pieces of it um, getting bogged down for both the students, but also for those of us in the education and the policy side. And I think that's a lot of what what drives your question here, Erica. You know, it's, you know how do we do this? <laughs> like we we can see the big picture of what does need to be done and what needs to be shifted, and that question of of how uh, can be so overwhelming. And so I think that Jerry, your points are massively important to consider exactly those places where we can intervene in the interim, right? Like, think about what public policy groups are out there right now doing advocacy and lobbying for uh, disability representation in the government, right? Uh, or who are working to make sure that uh, new technologies have uh, adequate uh, representation of disabled individuals uh, in their building uh, or in their considerations of how those technologies function at all, right? The FTC is doing work with, uh, you know, privacy concerns. Those privacy concerns also overlap a great deal with the things that we've been talking about, like, uh, you know, surveillance access, disability access, um, who's who's being watched and monitored more often than who, right? The, those questions of the, the disparately uh, marginalized experience of technology. So that work is being done in certain spaces, and we can find places where we can link in with them and we can amplify that work. We can lend our effort to that work. We can try to change the way that uh, classes are built, right? We can change the, the educational requirements. We can make pushes just even within our own universities or you know, school structures to try to push on the way that we talk about how these things are built, how these systems exist. And if we can make those changes at that level, we can then uh, push that out into the conversation that happens between uh, the people who get educated and the educators there, but also those places where they will then go and get jobs, what their bosses will even think to tell them. You know, we can have the conversation with uh, business and uh, private business and talk about the fact that, you know, if they need to hear it this way, it's honestly just better for your bottom line. Right, and we can have a conversation about how if they don't have to spend their time and their effort fixing their, you know, their, their mess ups on the back end, they can in fact just keep going in a different way. They can build differently from the ground up and not have to worry about the bad PR, the uh, millions of dollars spent in recompense when you know something disables someone further, uh, when it doesn't include a disabled person's experience in a way that it should have from the beginning. We can push on these existing spaces, these existing frameworks, and we can lend our efforts to them. And we can build on that from there and we can amplify public awareness. We can use the amplification of public awareness as a point of pressure. We can mobilize, we can, uh, you know, do a kind of uh, collective advocacy that allows us to build on the power of all of this desire to do this work, this drive that people have to do this work, but that is oftentimes uh, at loose ends. It's, uh, it's, it's at loose ends, it's siloed, people have the drive, the idea, the, the wantingness, the willingness to do it, but don't necessarily know where to start. And I think if we can do that from the positions where that we hold, we can give people that kind of clarity that AJ and Gerald were talking about to figure out exactly how to make these huge changes that are necessary. Thanks, Damien. Um, I'm gonna call on Lauren next, and then after that, uh, we're gonna take some questions from the audience. So be thinking about and typing in your questions now. Uh, Lauren. Um, super quick point. Um, I think everything that was just mentioned by AJ, Jara, and Damien, it's not important just to hopefully have it that society sees disabled people differently, but that also as disabled people, we see ourselves differently because I think we need to really alleviate all internet, uh, internalized ableism, uh, which I think is so 
uh, toxic. And when society starts to see us differently, I think that we will also see us are like ourselves differently. I remember I did a um, presentation on uh, invisible disability in the workplace. And right before the event, someone came to talk to me uh, in private message and was basically like, I really want to access this uh, presentation that you're doing, but I'm afraid that my colleagues are going to see that I, I participate into it. And I'm like, we put a lot of obstacles onto ourselves. I'm not saying that it's our fault or whatever. It's just the way it is. And it would be really nice if we could, yeah, just make it disappear everything that that we stop ourselves from doing because we're disabled or and it can be extended to, you know, internalized racism, internalized sexism, you know, whatever. So yeah, I think it's really a mindset that uh, that's worth uh, mentioning. It's a really valuable point, Lauren. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I just, uh, people have been typing some questions, so I just wanted to give you all an opportunity to uh, answer some of them. Um, one that I'm looking at right now is from Benjamin Rackley, who says, uh, the FAA has a big hand in certifying people for flight. Is there any discussion with them about certifying people with disabilities for flight, for example, someone on ADHD medication? And I think this is interesting question in the broader context of there's a lot of organizations that already have really stringent physical requirements or rule out people with certain disabilities, including the military where a lot of astronauts came from in the first place. So how do we shift or work with these, these agencies or shift away from them um, as we're trying to increase accessibility in space? Um, any of you have any thoughts you want to share on that? Damien. This is Damien. Uh, this gets to that point that we were just you know, just having a conversation about, frankly, this it requires a systemic shift, it requires an across the board change of uh, how people in those spaces think about what it means to exist as a part of those organizations, right? Um, so you have the military, uh, where, as you said, a lot of, uh, a lot of astronauts come from the military. But one of the things about being in the military is that if you're in the military long enough, depending upon how you are intersecting and uh, providing service within the military, you will likely become disabled. The United States military especially spends uh, billions upon billions of dollars a year dealing with the mental and physical disabilities that result from military service. Whether they deal with them well is a totally different question, but they have to spend the money. And so much of what they're currently doing is once again about this kind of post hoc, after the fact, fixing of a problem that they allowed to come to be in the first place. Where if they were to consider differently what it would take to have that access in place from the get go, it wouldn't necessarily prevent the disabling effects of military service, but it would have in place for them a framework, a system, which would be more easily linked into than what they are currently trying to do. And that goes for the FAA, that goes for pilot certifications, that goes for the entire idea of what it means to have the quote unquote right stuff to be an astronaut, right? If you have this framework at the beginning where it's only about perfectly able-bodied, non-disabled people, <laughs> then everything you do is going to be an attempt to fix quote unquote fix something that has gone quote unquote wrong rather than recognizing that bodies change and that we are putting bodies under tremendous pressure and the body mind is going to shift under that pressure and is going to change under that pressure and it needs to and that that's something that we just should be aware of and thinking about from the outset changing the ways that we think about what it means to be certified for this kind of service in the first place is fundamental to that. Thanks, Damien. Um, AJ, did you want to answer this as well? Yeah, hi, this is AJ. Not to go too much on the tangent, but Damien touched on the history of space exploration and its tie 
uh, and, and just historical link to militarization um, and potential occupation and potential colonization. Uh, and that is a huge issue, right? And I think that also shapes the narrative of what's quote unquote the right stuff. What is the right body to be successful in order to be militaristic and be violent and potentially be a colonizer in space, right? That shapes and frames the thinking. And that is just a really, really big, I don't even know what to call it in the room, right? I don't want to call it an elephant because like it is the room. It's built into the structure of how we view space exploration. And I just want to touch on one more thing. And it's it's the paternal loop, the paternalism, right? The charity model of disability, right? We are protecting disabled folks from themselves by not allowing them to contribute to certain activities in certain parts of society, right? It's not that we fear disability. We are not ableist. We are not um, disabilophobic we are protecting disabled people from themselves and from the dangers of society. And that kind of paternalism is still ableism and it's still a way to erect barriers, but you're just using the fraudulent claims of concern for people with disabilities. Unless of course you're spreading inspiration porn and you're saying, look at these wonderful disabled people overcoming these barriers, right? And so it's, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly frustrating. And it's, it's, it's also so insidious that sometimes it can be overwhelming when you really start digging into it. Thank you both um, for your answers to that. Um, so with the five minutes we have left, I'm just gonna put together one more question. I'm sort of synthesizing this question off of some comments by a couple of different people in the comments. One is Ruben Patino and one is uh, Maurice Ramirez. So both of them talked about um, disabled and in particular um, neurodivergent kids in the classroom and their experience experiences um, and how could what we've learned for neurodivergent children in the classroom and students in the classroom, their experiences, um, as you referenced before, AJ, with their, their being pulled aside for special education classrooms, what's worked, what hasn't, what can we learn from that particular experience that a lot of disabled people share um, about uh, designing for and improving accessibility in space? Is there anything, uh, lessons learned from that um, that we can take with us? AJ. Hi, this is AJ. I don't know about lessons because I don't know if it's ever been done well, but I want to be clear that including disabled folks does not mean not providing access for them. So just because neurodivergent or um, folks with disabilities are in quote unquote general education does not mean that they should not be getting the care and access and services that they need. Uh, that is two completely different things, right? Again, it goes back to paternalism where we're separating them out to protect them and give them access instead of being inclusive and integrative and providing them access in the classroom so that they still have the ability to be with other folks. I don't know if that's ever been done properly or well. I'm sure there are examples. I'm just not knowledgeable enough, but I did want to make that clarification. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Jared? Hi, this is Jara speaking. Yeah, um, I can't speak to like the K through 12 model, um, but I can speak about higher ed a little bit, um, which when we think about um, how the classroom is set up, right? So everything from the actual physical space, right? The access to that space to, um, you know, people's comfort in that space to the kinds of readings, to the activities, um, to exams, right? So all of those kinds of things play a role um, in terms of, you know, neurodivergence anxiety, physical access, um, the, you know, the, the room, I, uh, the design studio I work in, the tables are um, about three and a half, four feet high. Um, so you have to sit at a high stool. There are no backs on the stool. So physical access right off the bat, right? Um, what kinds of activities as an educator am I providing? Um, I don't give exams. I don't give quizzes. Um, I have never in all the time I've been teaching done that because I don't feel that that's, uh, uh, that's accessible to most people. Um, every single student in my class can turn in things um, and say, I'm not done. Here's the assignment. This was the due date. I'm not done. Here's what I've done so far. Can I get feedback? Um, if you can't or if you can't write um, well, um, you feel like you can't write well, if speaking is more your key, set up an appointment. You can do your assignment verbally with me. Um, so try to set up the kinds of access that make it inclusive for everybody. Every single student in the room, regardless of whether they have you know, documentation with the accessibility office or not, I don't care. You can give me that, that information. I'm happy to take it. I'm happy to work with you. 
But if you don't have that information, you'd still have access to any of these things because people learn differently anyway. And so by trying to change the entire um, the entire space, the entire learning environment to a, to a way of enabling people to do the work in the ways that they do it best um, is going to give students the ability to work how they feel they can. And they can do their best work that way. But the problem is, is I'm in higher ed. And that's not the way it is before they get to me. And so, and right now I'm at a pretty elite institution. Um, I've worked at state schools, same thing, right? To get out of a, you know, it doesn't matter what school you're at. If you're at higher ed, the amount of people that can get to higher ed, especially if they've been sidelined or told they can't do something, or if they've been, you know, um, they've been mainstreamed without the right support, then they're not going to be able to get to where I am anyway. So I think, again, what do we do in the interim is we have to figure out ways to get to those students who, uh, and in the same way, right? So what can I do as a as a educator in a university? I can get outside of the university. Where can I go to do that work? The design work I'm doing with college kids, I could do with second graders too. I mean, it's it's not, um, you know, it's about enabling students to be able to think for themselves, enabling people to be able to think for themselves and decide what's important to them, right? And that model, I think, actually would work as well. So I think it's up to those of us who are already doing that work to figure out how to bring it to other other spaces and places outside of the outside of the uh, traditional educational system. Yeah. End of thought. Thank you, Jara. Um, we're right at the end. Uh, Lauren, you still have your hand up. So if you want to give a, a quick answer, I'm happy to let you uh, have the last comment here. Yeah, just wanted to build on what was said again. Um, I think making things inclusive for the entire community as opposed to making accommodations, but only by separating you from the community is such the way to go be because in my example, for example, at uni, I had the right to ask for accommodations, but I felt super ashamed to have them. I felt like I was given a free pass and I was scared to talk about it with my peers, with my you know fellow students. So I was just isolating myself, just praying that no one notices that I'm not in the big room with everyone and that in another room. So I feel like it's, yeah, it's so important to, to make things accessible by integrating you to the community rather than marginalizing you even more. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and uh, AJ, I'm sorry, I think we're out of time. And I think we're going to lose the room. Do you have uh, like a quick comment you want to make? Yes, this is AJ. I know we're out of time, but I wanted to flag for Maurice that I'm not really interested in diversity and inclusion and equality because that is forcing it upon people. I am interested in access to spaces. Not everyone wants to be forced to be included and be tokenized. Not everyone wants to be in a forced diversity climate. Sometimes you want to be in a climate that is not diverse and around your own community, and that is okay as long as you have access. I'm also interested in equity, not equality, uh, but that is it, and I'm happy to close it. Thank you, AJ. And thank you all uh, for your fantastic uh, discussion and conversation. I really enjoyed this. And uh, thank you to those of you uh, who attended. Um, and uh, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.